Well, good afternoon, university community. I'm so excited you're here. We have such a special hour planned for you. I just can't wait to get started. What a, what a great day. I'm Brian Buford. I'm the executive director for University Culture and Employee Success. And I wanna say welcome, along with my teammates, Megan West and Laura McDaniels, we're really here today to celebrate the launch of the new Employee Success Center that is at the heart of the Great Place to Work strategic plan we created in 2019, and we have been in the midst of implementing now. And the Employee Success Center is really a chance for faculty and staff at the university to keep learning and growing, to feel connected and engaged at work, to feel like they belong and they matter, and to know that there are people here at the university who are helping them and supporting them in that growth. And we do that at the Employee Success Center through many things, mentoring, training, career growth, coaching, workshop, leadership development, many things. You'll see our website address there on the screen. So I just encourage all of you to go check us out. If you're a faculty or staff member, start thinking about how we at the Employee Success Center can help you reach your goals this year. That's what we're here for. That's what we're excited about. Now, I mentioned leadership development, and which I think will probably be the topic of the day in our conversation. But I also want to tell all of you, just in, in a, a, as part of our celebration, that we are launching a new Cardinal Leadership Institute next week. And with us today on the call are 23 university leaders who will make up the first cohort for the Institute, along with the instructors. And so this is a deep sort of five month journey, really looking at the, you know, just what it means to be a, a great compassionate leader in our environment. And so I, I'm so excited to just say welcome to this cohort, to our instructors. And I hope today is a, a, just a moment of inspiration as you get started on this journey. I also wanna just say, as we get started, a very deep sense of gratitude and thanks to all the people who made this come together. This is a this is a, a sort of a big thing. And um, a lot of people worked hard to bring this event to you. So I'm so grateful. I just wanna say a special thanks to Kyle Hurwitz uh, for his involvement and also the whole team from the president's office who brought energy and enthusiasm and a, just a great deal of expertise to making this happen. So thank you to everyone. Now, let's get to the business of the day. I wanna tell you about our guest, author and speaker, Simon Sinek. Simon, uh, I love this, is an unshakable optimist who believes in a bright future and our ability to build it together. Uh, Simon's devoted his life to really advancing a vision in which people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are, and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do. And I love so much about that, but I especially love that it just lines up with the vision of the Employee Success Center and the mission of what we want to do. We want to make sure that people end every day feeling fulfilled by the work that they do here at UofL. And with Simon is someone who inspires me and I know inspires many of you in our university community to bring our passion and our brilliance to the challenges our university is tackling. And that is our wonderful and dear president, Dr. Neely Bendapudi. So Simon, Neely, welcome. Thank you both so much. We're excited to have this conversation with you and uh, just really cannot say thank you enough for, your, for the gift of your time. Neely, take it away. Thank you, Brian. Hi, everybody. I so fully echo everything that Brian has said. So thank you, Kyle my office team, and of course, Simon. Uh, I wanna tell you all a little bit. I have been on this leadership journey for many, many years, thinking about how do we create cultures where people feel it's a great place to work? You know, not just as some rhetoric, but something deeply meaningful and fulfilling. So I'll ask you to imagine something very quickly. How many of us get up in the morning, 
We're getting ready to, we used to be able to getting re be getting ready to go to work. Maybe you're getting ready to sit at your dining room table, like Simon is, uh, getting ready to do something. But as we get ready for work, truly, how many of us think, oh man, I can't wait. I cannot wait to start work today and really, really screw up. I don't think the majority of us do. The majority of us look forward to making a positive impact and making a difference. And why is it that we as leaders don't treat everybody that way? That these are humans coming in and saying, I'm offering up my potential. I want to do this for the organization and for my soul as something that is nourishing and flourishing and being part of making a big positive change. So Simon Sinek, I know we've given you the bio and knowing from the overwhelming number of registrations, Brian and I have a sneaking suspicion it's not because you want to listen to us one more time. So I know you know a great deal about Simon, and I truly am enthused to bring him to you. I really am. I've had the great good fortune of, I don't know, from um, Steve Wozniak to Mark Zuckerberg. But I will tell you, I've interviewed them, but I will tell you, I have never been more excited, so maybe equally excited, to have bring somebody as Simon Sinek, because his philosophy fits so well with what we are trying to do here at the University of Louisville. So first of all, Simon, welcome, sir. We are truly delighted to have you here. Um, I'm going to start off by asking you, why is it you think it's so important for all of us to start with our own why we do things? What's your why for leadership development? So my why is to inspire people to do the things that inspire them. So together each of us can change our world for the better. It is the foundation of everything I do. It's what drives me, it's what inspires me, uh, it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, uh, learning to start with why, it, it profoundly changed my life. Uh, it profoundly changed the, not only the trajectory of my career, but it, it, it profoundly changed the way I felt about every single day. Um, and, and, and so, when, we, when you talk about why should anybody start with why, I mean, first of all, it's a choice. Nobody has to do anything. Um, um, but when I saw the impact that it had on my life and then it had the impact that it had on my friends' lives and colleagues' lives, and the more I started to share the idea, the more I, I started to hear stories of the same thing, uh, it, it became, it became a, a, a compulsion to want to share it with even more people. Love it. So clearly we are trying to say uh, one of the things we want to do is to be a great place to work. It's not about a better place to work, not about better than the other guy. It's really about a great place to work. Mm. Uh, so would you share your thoughts? You've done so much research into what makes organizations great places to work for people. Can you talk a little bit about that, Simon? Well, first of all, I love the fact that you're focusing on, on your own people. You know, so many, I think, um, universities um, uh, don't understand the role of 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 of, uh, of leadership. You know, you, you you talk to senior leadership in a university and you say, "What's your priority?" And they always say the same thing: our students, which it's not. It's to take care of the people who take care of the students. It's like in a hospital. You talk to hospital administrators. They say, "Our priority is our patients." No, it's not. It's to take care of the people who take care of the patients. And when people in the organization feel like the organization sees them, hears them. Uh, uh, recognizes them as human beings, um, that they have ambitions and stresses um, and, and looks to take care of them as human beings, um, then they can invest all of their energy into the work that they're supposed to be doing, uh, taking care of each other and taking care of the students and any other work that needs to be done. Um, too often, uh, when leadership doesn't understand that, um, our own people have to protect ourselves from our leadership. Uh, in an organization where it's common practice for people to keep a folder of all the good things they've ever done in the, at work, you know, just in case they need it, that's a sign that people are taking time and energy out of their day, away from doing their jobs, in order to protect themselves from their own leadership. That's what that is. So I, yeah. I love that you're doing that. I do like what you just said. Instead of saying we will be protected because of our leaders, they're actually thinking I need to be protected from our leaders. So I would venture to say those are people who are managers and not really genuinely leaders in the best yeah. sense of that term. That's fair. Um, 
We've launched our whole employee success center, Simon, as you know, to strengthen the culture. Uh, and we all talk about what culture is. And to me, culture is what you're doing when nobody's checking on what you're doing. Culture is what we tolerate. Uh, culture is what we celebrate. Any tips, thoughts on how we build and maintain strong, great cultures? Uh, unfortunately, culture is one of those mushy terms that uh, is uh, at best ill-defined. Um, uh, my favorite definition of culture is culture equals values plus behavior, um, and so, which means one of two, uh, one thing, which is you have to have your values clearly defined. You can't have fifteen or twenty values. You know, they can't. You can't remember them all. The the, the most effective I've ever seen is uh, no more than five. And if you have more than five, you can probably find overlap. Um, and then are your behaviors consistent with the values that you espouse? Um, that means that your recognition and reward systems need to incentivize the behaviors that promote your values. Um, also, I think values uh, are, are, are often poorly uh, defined. Um, very often they're defined as nouns, um, but they're supposed to be things we do. They're supposed to be behaviors. So when you write on the wall, honesty, integrity, innovation, you can't walk into someone's office and say a little more innovation this week, please. What are they supposed to do? Everybody thinks they're honest, so writing honesty on the wall seems ridiculous. Um, but if you write them as verbs, honesty becomes tell the truth. Integrity becomes do the right thing. Innovation becomes look at the problem from a different angle. Now, all of a sudden, you can do these things, promote these things, incentivize these things. So I think one, values have to be very, very clearly defined. And let's be crystal clear, values are not aspirational. It's not about a bunch of people getting into a room and saying, who do we want to be? That's not what values are. Your values are who you are when you operate at your natural best. What behaviors show up when you ap operate at your natural best? Write those down and then work and incentivize people to work to the natural best. I completely agree, which is why sometimes people have wondered, we've called them our cardinal principles because to me, they become values when they are lived. So these are the principles. We talk about being a community of care. We talk about being accountable, acting with integrity. All of those in action would be your lived brand, not just the brand that you are claiming to be, but who you are and what, what you ought to be. Um, and I would recommend dropping the gerund. It's not yeah. acting with integrity, it's act with integrity. That's true, absolutely. Yeah. I, absolutely, I I, uh, I understand. So it's living whatever yeah. values that we talk about. That's that's clearly uh, what it is. Yeah. Uh, you talked about protecting ourselves from our leaders, and I I chuckle at that because it's true. Sometimes it's like, is my manager in a good mood today? Is it okay to talk to them? What do they want to do, etc. But can we talk about who true leaders are in an organization? Uh, to me, that doesn't have to be a manager. Uh, well, how do you see true leadership as opposed to someone who merely has a title and is a manager and not a real leader at heart? Yeah, so leadership uh, has nothing to do with rank. Uh, rank affords us authority, um, but that doesn't make us a leader. I know many people who, who sit at the highest levels of organizations who are not leaders. Um, we do as they tell us because they have authority over us, but we wouldn't trust them or choose to follow them. Uh, uh, I know many people who are, have no formal rank or authority, but they've made the choice to look after the person to the left of them and look after the person to the right of them, and we would trust them and follow them anywhere. Leadership fundamentally is the responsibility to see those around us rise. And if you have formal rank, that, if, that can give you the opportunity to see those around us rise at greater scale. Um, um, but, but, uh, but leadership has nothing to do with the title we hold. Um, um, and simply by being given a title doesn't make you a leader. Um, uh, that is a, that is a, that is an, something you have to work towards, um, uh, for sure. And, and, you know, the idea of providing safety, you know, if your boss is in a bad mood, we all have good days and bad days. That, that's not really what safety means. It's that institutionally, do I feel like I can trust the organization with how I feel with my, with, with asking for help? Um, and will I get penalized? Will it hurt my career or will the organization rush in to support me? That's a really good point. I guess what I was saying is that it is important for people who do have those titles and authority to think about how they're showing up. If yeah. your job is to help other people rise, then I do think with authority comes that responsibility Absolutely. to make sure you're there for people. Uh, Absolutely. And if you're having a bad day, you know, if you didn't get a lot of sleep or something, you know, if your kids are acting up or you're stressed, 
to be open about it. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, because if you're open about it, it encourages other people to be open about the challenges they're having. You know, leaders lead by example. That's very, very true. So it's not about being artificial or uh, no. it's it's about being honest, showing up yeah. as, a, as a human in a, a human environment. Absolutely. Now, as we talk about these behaviors, something I so appreciate about you, Simon, and our uh, intro conversation is how you said, hey, I'm not here to talk about my books. I've got enough. I've done enough. Really make sure it works for you. I love that perspective because I think that's the perspective of helping and being of service that comes through to me in Infinite Games. I bet that almost all the people who are on this call have watched Simon's TEDx Talks, or if not, they'll go do that now. Uh, so this philosophy of the long run, it's not about a, a transactional today mindset. Tell me a little bit about the intriguing title of the Infinite Game. What, what is that about? Um, the the definition of the infinite game was first put forward in the mid 1980s by a philosopher by the name of Dr. James Kars, um, and he defined these two types of games: finite games and infinite games. A finite game he defined as known players, fixed rules, and an agreed upon objective: football, baseball. Uh, and if there is a winner, then then there has to be a loser by definition. Um, infinite games are defined as known and unknown players, which means new players can join at any time. The rules are changeable, which means we can play however we want. And the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. Um, we are players in infinite games every day of our lives, whether we know it or not. There's no such thing as winning global politics. There's no such thing as winning healthcare. Nobody wins education. You can come in first for the finite amount of time you're in school with the formal grading system, sure, but you know, but you, nobody wins education. It doesn't exist. Nobody wins career. Um, but if you listen to the language of so many leaders, it becomes abundantly clear that they don't know the game that they're playing. They talk about being number one, being the best, or beating their competition. Based on what? Based upon what agreed upon objectives, metrics, or timeframes. And this is a problem, because when we play with a finite mindset in an infinite game, when we play to win at a game that has no finish line, there's some very predictable and consistent outcomes. The big ones include the decline of trust, cooperation, and innovation. And we definitely see this in education. We talk about universities claiming that they're the best, Based on what? We haven't agreed upon any time frames or any standard metrics. Number one, based on your acceptance rate. Number one, based on the starting salaries of your graduating students, which is the worst way for a university pr to promote itself. Um, but uh, uh, so it's, it's kind of an arbitrary system. Uh, but rather, uh, it's a much healthier system um, uh, to, to, to maintain an infinite mindset, which is ultimately a game of constant improvement. How do we make our systems better this year than we, they were last year? How do we make our culture stronger this year than uh, better, uh, make our culture stronger this year than it was last year? How do we make our leaders better this year than they were last year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it goes down all the way down the, uh, down the pike. So uh, yeah, it's ultimately a game of constant improvement. So is that something um, that I've Oh, I lost you. I lost you for a second there. Say the question again. Sorry about that. So I'm assuming that's a philosophy or a mindset that applies to one's personal life as much as it does to the world of work, your personal relationships. Yeah, I mean, an infinite mindset can, can apply anywhere where you where where the infinite game exists. I mean, you know, the, the, the first question you have to ask yourself, what game am I in? The infinite game is, is not the absence of finite games. If anything, it's the con the context within which finite games exist. Um, the example I like to use is think of it more like a lifestyle. Like if I want to be healthy, right? There's certain things I have to do. I have to eat well. I have to exercise. I have to get sleep. Nurse my personal relationships. And I can I can I can set a finite game up in inside of that. I want to lose X amount of weight by X date. It's an arbitrary number set by an arbitrary date, which is usually how most professional goals are set as well. They're usually arbitrary. Hit this number by this date, you know. Um, uh, and I can work very hard, and 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 every day I stand on the scale and see the metrics. And we love metrics. Metrics help us feel like we're making progress. There's nothing wrong with metrics. They're good. They're important. Um, and if you hit your goal, if you lose the amount of weight you wanted to hit on the right day, you feel all excited. Um, uh, but you have to keep exercising for the rest of your life. Like it doesn't. It's it's not over. But likewise, if you miss your goal, nothing happens. Absolutely nothing happens. It was a guidance. 
it was ultimately what it was as a measure of speed and distance. That's what metrics are. How much, how, how far have we gone and how fast are we going? Um, but missing the goal or hitting the goal, like I said, it, it ultimately does nothing um, uh, to the organization itself or to your life. So I like to think of all of these things like lifestyle, um, whether it's personal, our careers, our relationships, our education, or the organization itself. You think of it as this ongoing process of which there are finite games that help drive towards something bigger, but they're like, like I said, they're there to drive behavior, not, not to define it. Uh, so Simon, as you suggested, uh, I, which I agree, whether you're a leader or not, you don't know by looking at the org chart. You look at the org chart and you can say, am I a manager because I see people reporting to me or not? You know if you're a leader to see if anybody is choosing to follow you. And part of our Cardinal Leadership um, Academy, you've heard, we're trying to create leaders, uh, discover. Create does not sound right. Discover, nurture, there are leaders already here and provide them with the tools and the techniques to help them to be uh, more effective. One of the key things for any leader uh, is to uh, create this culture of engagement to win the trust, as you said. And I agree, safety is first. We need to people make people feel safe and esteemed and treated fairly for them to fully engage. But because we have so many current and aspiring leaders listening to this, what have you discovered about how the great leaders create engagement among the people they lead? Um, well, they have to be interested in their people and they have to see their people as human beings rather than cogs in a machine. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, there's the, the, the curiosity and empathy are a big are a big deal. Um, um, I'll give you an example. Um, um, you know, here's a, re a reasonably standard normal uh, scenario. Uh, you know, uh, a boss walks into someone's office and says, your numbers are down for the third quarter in a row. You know, we've had this conversation before, and if you don't pick up your numbers in the fourth quarter, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, that's fairly normal. Here's what that conversation looks like if empathy is engaged. Um, you know, you walk into their office and say, your numbers are down for the third quarter in a row. We've had this conversation before. Are you okay? I'm worried about you. What's going on? That's what empathy looks like in the workplace. Also, uh, being open to the, the fact that, you know, we're also very quick to judge. You know, if somebody is performance is down, we could label them as lazy uh, uh, or, or difficult. And that may be true, um, but it's also a good practice to think of 20 other things that it could be. Um, they're having trouble with their kids. Uh, they have too much work on their plate. Uh, we've given them a position or a job that they don't know what they're doing and they're lying, hiding and faking every day. Like there could be a, a, a host of reasons that, that performance is down. Um, not that they're just lazy or difficult. Um, those can be on the list, but the point is it makes us more open-minded to, to what could be going on in their lives and to be curious, to find out which thing on the list is it. And if they're just being difficult and asking curious questions, they tend to take accountability and say, you know what, I've just, I'm sorry, you're right, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I think curiosity and empathy are, are, are undervalued uh, uh, characteristics inside, inside any organization. Oh, actually, I have to ask you this because uh, uh, among my team, as we were talking about these behaviors, I love it. Curiosity and empathy, you know, that we, that's characteristics to bring to any situation. So our team was talking about it and we were saying, you must have heard so many kinds of leadership stories and seen for yourself both the inspiring and cringeworthy. So before we go back to the inspiring, is there anything that comes to mind as really awful behavior that, you know, you have to laugh because you can't cry or vice versa? I mean, yeah, I tend to focus on the positive stuff, but you know, the, the, the cringeworthy stuff is fairly, fairly consistent. Um, when one person thinks they have all the answers and doesn't need to ask for help, those, those tend to be, um, those tend to be pretty, pretty common. Um, uh, uh, you know, the Sun King uh, complex. Um, uh, nobody knows all the answers. Um, and for one person to think they do is kind of funny. Um, uh, the quick to judge is, 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 as I said before, that's, that's very common because then what we do is we treat people based on our judgment, not based on what's actually going on and become self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, 100%. Um, very often the, the, these things can, can come to life because we will them to come to life. <laughs>
Indeed, indeed. And the fundamental attribution error that if it's me, it's all the environment. I'm perfect. But if it's someone else, it's all you. You, right. you it's your fault. That's as very nice, as, as good as it as good as it feels. It's not very. Yeah, nice. exactly, exactly. Uh, we could do a whole thing on about uh, how we deceive ourselves th those decision yeah. traps. That's for sure. So let's get back to positive leaders. I I agree. I'm. Uh, I, I confess that I tend to be rather optimistic myself, so I get it. Uh, let's talk about leaders earning trust. You know, you give trust, create a place of trust, but we also earn it over time. So one situation is, let us say someone here is a leader, I'll offer myself up and say that you need to re-earn trust. Um, you know, how do you rebuild trust if it's lost? I ask that because, it's not just about individuals, but institutions. Let us say an office, uh, a leadership, a or even a person that says, I want to do better. You know, you can't just say the words and make them magically turn up overnight. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, think of it like any personal relationship. If you, if you violate the trust of a friend, um, you have to work extra hard to earn that trust back. It doesn't mean that it's irreparable. Um, it just means that extra work is required and proof is required. Also, we have to accept that um, people trust at their own time frame. Some people trust more quickly and trust, some people trust more slowly. Some people are willing to forgive more quickly and some people are willing to forgive more slowly. We, we, can't, we can't expect everyone to fall in line at the same time. At, so at an organizational level, you'll earn the trust of some people, but not everyone you know, immediately or, you know, and sometimes your words are enough if people suspect that they're, that they're, uh, they're, they're genuine. Um, uh, but again, actions, actions and words must align. Um, you know, I've never heard a great leader ever say to their people, prove to me why I should trust you. It's the other way around. It's, yeah, it's the leader that has to earn the trust of their people. And if an organization fails, then honesty really is the best policy, you know, to come out and admit the failing and 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 we and unfortunately, whether it's in politics or government or education or business, we just don't see people accepting accountability. We demand accountability from our people, but then we don't we don't do it ourselves organizationally. And I, for whatever reason, um, uh, so I think accountability uh, is is number one, and and not this sort of like nonsense asking for forgiveness. You know, we, right? The non-apology. The it's not it's the it's either the non-apology or. Like we've seen this from we've seen this unfortunately from Facebook too much, you know, uh, where they screw up, they screw up, they do nothing, they do nothing, and then Zuckerberg goes in front of Congress and apologizes, and then the cycle repeats, and and there has to be a break in behavior. So the, the apology is just not enough. Agreed. Agreed completely. Um, I think that's so true. Just saying you're sorry again and again and not changing your behavior is no way to. Uh, earn back that trust that we are talking. It makes us about. cynical for what for when yeah. you really are uh, uh, sorry. No, the I agree. With you. Um, so, how can peers help one another be better leaders? We've talked about how not every leader is at the top of the organizational hierarchy. So, let us say that um, there's someone who steps up and they are middle management or they're frontline workers. And I'm a peer to some of those individuals. What can people do to support one another in being leaders, uh, assuming that mantle, even if it's not conferred upon you by title? Leadership is a team sport. Um, no one is strong enough or smart enough to lead alone. You're just not that good. No one is. Um, and so first of all, admitting that is a, is a big deal. And having a buddy, having a leadership buddy, really matters, like someone who you decide you go on the journey with and you're gonna be honest with each other and give each other feedback and give mm. each other tough love sometimes and point things out. You know, I, I have leadership buddies and sometimes right at the end of a meeting, they'll say, you were really hard in that meeting. You know, you can't talk to people that way. Or, or they'll say, hey, are you okay? But the point is, is there's 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 deep love and they know that we, we know that we're looking out for each other and we want each other to be better leaders. You know, again, I've never met a great leader who thinks they're an expert in leadership. Um, they all think they're students of leadership. And that means as a student, if you uh, are given a position of authority, if you're given a, 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 a leadership position, then you better start studying uh, if you haven't been before, which means reading books on the subject, watching talks on the subject, reading articles on the subject, uh, uh, taking classes on the subject, uh, talking to people about it. All the best leaders I know 
they they love the subject. They're obsessed with it. It's it's they they talk about it all the time. They're constantly constantly sharing notes and talking about things that went right and wrong. Um, and uh, and you you got to be a student on a journey. So agree. So Simon, the first time. I became aware of your work. I recall that I was, I think it was about the time when I was in a, a bank at Huntington Bank as their executive vice president. I bring that up because I look at all of these different settings outside of universities where people take leadership so seriously and say, what do we need to do? What are the skill sets you need? And as you said, I love this leadership buddy idea. In universities, just FYI, where we start we love the intellectual curiosity and we study everything. We seem to assume that as soon as you're promoted, somehow magically these leadership skills appear. So right. I really appreciate your bringing that up because this type of systematic focus on leadership is going to be critical, critical for us at a, a university. Um, so- Well, if you think about it, you would never let anyone teach without teaching them how to teach. You know, there's right. pedagogy. And you teach people how to run a class and you teach people how to resolve conflict in a class. And some people get teaching degrees if that, you know, um, you would never let anybody be an accountant without learning accounting. Why? Because we want them to be good at what they do. It's, it's really obvious. So just by promoting someone to a position of leadership, that doesn't necessarily they know what they're doing. So why do we expect people to know how to lead if we don't teach them how to lead? Mm -hmm. We expect somebody to learn something else. So uh, we have to teach leadership and we don't do a good job of teaching leadership. It's not a one day seminar with a couple of speakers. You know, it's ongoing education. Um, it's things like listening skills, conflict resolution, how to give and receive feedback, how to have, how to have difficult conversations. And we saw this, we saw the lack of leadership, for example, after George Floyd was assassinated, after George Floyd was killed, um, uh, where a lot of people in leadership positions did nothing, not because they're bad people, it's because they didn't know how to have a difficult conversation with their team. They, they were so afraid of, it, of saying the wrong thing, of inflaming a situation, that they chose to do nothing. But that's just a skill. We can teach people how to have a difficult conversation. Um, and those difficult conversations, especially when it comes to matters of race, are absolutely essential leadership skills. Could not agree more. So let's review some of the ones you brought up, because I agree. Listening, very, very important. Uh, conflict resolution, and really how to ask and receive feedback, and how to have difficult, crucial conversations. Did I miss anything else that you brought up? Uh, I mean, there's probably there's a there's a long list, but sure, that, that's a that's a good start. Yes. Which one is <laughs> which one do you find is the most difficult to uh, for people to learn? Listening. Most people are are really bad listeners. And, and, and there's a difference between hearing and listening. You know, um, there's a great little YouTube video, which I recommend for everybody to go watch. It's only two minutes long or something. It's called, it's not about the nail. If you just type it in, it's the one that has a bazillion, a bazillion views. Okay. Uh, and, and basically it sums up the difference between hearing and listening. And men are particularly bad. You know, we hear a problem and we want to fix it. Um, and sometimes listening is just letting someone feel heard. Um, and listening is trying to, get to the meaning of what's being said, not necessarily the words of what's being said. It's the subtext, it's the motivation, it's the mo it's the emotion under underlying. And most of us are very, very bad listeners. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, and I think that's a, it's, a, it's a learnable, practicable, teachable skill, and one one that needs to be uh, taught and and practiced in 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 every works in every work environment. I love it. Uh this, I, I, I will look up the video. I'm surprised I haven't seen it, but I will. There's a very old book on how to speak, how to listen by the people who wrote how to read, how to write. It's maybe 40 years old, but it's beautiful. And it talks about how we don't really listen. We're waiting for our turn to speak, Exactly. You know, right. which is the problem. Yeah, that's, exactly that's very right. good. Um, and talking about race, as you said, uh, we had Beverly Tatum talk, talk to us about why it's so hard to talk about race. So your advice is, learn how to do that, right? Because being a leader requires you to do that. Yeah, I'm, and, and I mean, I had to do it as well, you know? And I sought advice on how to do it. And, and what I learned is to start a conversation by saying to the team, um, we need to have a difficult conversation. Um, I'm uncomfortable and I'm nervous to have this conversation. I'm very afraid that I'll accidentally say the wrong thing that will trigger someone and inflame the situation. But ultimately, 
our need to have this conversation is more important than any fears that I have about having this conversation. So I'm going to ask for your help as we stumble through this because we have to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. That's how you start a difficult conversation, very, very honestly. Mm -hmm. And it sets a tone. Mm -hmm. um, and then the leader goes first and says how they feel um, and talks about literally their emotions. Um, and, and when people say emotions have no place at work, that's absolute nonsense. You know, we have anger, we have frustration, we have fatigue, we have, we have all kinds of, we have, we have ego. Emotion drives us every single day at work. You can't take emotion out of a human being, which means you can't take emotion out of work because last I checked, all human beings are the ones at work. So uh, uh, we have to just learn how to be emotionally professional, yes, but, but learn how to, to express our emotions in a way that, that uh, creates a positive and safe environment. 100%. And we know from research that if you have no emotions, you're not going to be able to make decisions. You know, it's part of what drives us as human beings. It's managing those emotions might be important, but it's ridiculous to say no emotions at work. Very, very true. Um, anything else you want to say? We'll have questions from our audience. So I'm very, very excited. Any other skills? Because Simon, I'm serious. The things you're throwing out, are the topics that Brian will be exploring through the Leadership Academy. We'll be talking yeah. about. I mean, I get asked this question a lot, like what are the five most important characteristics of a leader? Like, you know, vision, charisma. It's like, I know some amazing leaders who are not big Steve Jobs visionaries. I know some Absolutely. ones don't have big charisma. For me, the one consistent one that I see all the time is courage. Mm. Uh, leadership requires courage. One, to act with integrity requires courage. So yes, integrity is on the list, but it still requires courage. Doing the right thing, um, even though it might be um, unpopular. Um, doing the right thing that might um, include short-term losses. Like you're actually going to put your organization through a short-term stress, but it's the right thing to do. Courage is the big thing. Um, sometimes putting your own career on the line. You actually might lose your career to do the right thing. And very, very, I mean, we look at I mean, just to the point of politics today, the, the, how few of our leaders are willing to put their careers on the line to do the right thing, you know, it's, a, it's, it's nothing short of a lack of courage. Mm -hmm. um, courage is a very, very, very big deal in leadership. I love it. I love it. I find that our cardinals are, are big on courage and they're very resilient. So that gives me great hope for where we are. So Brian Buford, I hope we've had, I know we've had questions from the audience. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, to, and then I'll come back to some closing comments. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for welcoming me back. And let me just say to our guests that if you have a question you haven't posted yet, uh, there's space there on the page to include your questions. We'll try to get it to as many of them as we can. Um, let me start with this one, though. Uh, Simon, we talked about racial injustice and systemic racism a little bit. But this employee asks, you know, thinking about this idea of curiosity and empathy. Um, and during a time of racial injustice and of course the pandemic that is really, you know, just a, such a hard challenge for our organizations, what would you say is the responsibility of leaders to pause during these like moments of crisis and offer relief to employees? We, we actually saw something really interesting happen when COVID began, um, which is we saw a lot of people in leadership positions, um, uh, whether they were effective or ineffective leaders prior to COVID, we saw them pick up the phone, call each team member and say, are you okay? How are you doing? Mm. They just sort of, they just trusted their instincts as human beings. And by the way, that's just called good leadership. It doesn't require a crisis for that to happen. That's, that should be happening all the time. And to call somebody and express just honest concern and give them a safe space to just feel heard, to just listen, um, is a really big deal. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, that's a large part of it. Um, it's sometimes just checking in on people, mm -hmm. you know? And we talk about courage. You know, I don't believe courage is some deep internal fortitude where you dig down deep and find the courage, you know? Uh, courage comes from our, the strength of our relationships. It, all it requires is one person, whether it's a colleague or a friend, to say, I got your back. I believe in you. You got this. That gives us the courage to do difficult things. Um, I, I had the opportunity to meet people who risked their lives to save the lives of others. And when asked, why did you do it? You've got a family. You didn't have to do it. Why did you do it? They all say something very similar, which is they would have done it for me. Someone mm -hmm. would have done it for me. Mm -hmm. And it's the belief that someone has my back that gives us the courage to do difficult things. If we don't think anyone has our back, 
we won't do those. We, 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 it, we won't find the courage and we will become selfish. Yeah, thank so you for that, Simon. The quality of relationships really do have a trickle effect, a ripple effect. Yeah, you know, and along those lines, um, the question here, so there are leaders who who are contributing to a toxic workplace who really don't know it, don't realize, they don't wake up and think every day I'm making this place horrible for the people around me. And so how, what is the, what is your thought about like opening that channel of self-awareness? How do we bring those leaders to the table and, and help them understand how important those those actions are um, when they are sort of making life miserable for the folks who work for them? It's a very hard question. You know, it, it's like the old joke, um, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> you know, uh, the first the first criterion for being a leader is you have to want to be one. Yeah. And, and, and you have to be willing to accept and ask the question, how am I doing? And if somebody's close to that, to that uh, input, then unfortunately, it's no number of anonymously sent books is going to change their mind or change the way they lead. And so in those circumstances, we have to we have to become the leaders we wish we had. In other words, despite the despite the toxicity above us, we have to take care of the people around us. We have to create a safe space for the people next to us. We don't it's not about abandon. It's it 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 it, it becomes an incentive for the people inside the organization to really up their leadership skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if great. somebody's open to it, then and they're open to that feedback, that's that's a magical thing. Yeah. Oh, and that was the next question: was what do what do those employees do when they're sort of trapped in a you know in a bad leadership situation yeah. with leaders who don't know they're causing them harm? What what can they do? Yeah. Um, to make things better for themselves. Well, one is as I said before, take care of each other. Yeah. Uh, um, um, and also, you know. Very often, we have to have empathy up the chain, not just down the chain. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody's, you know, you can walk in, just like I gave that example of, you know, a boss who comes into an employee's office and criticizes the, the performance, you know, it goes the other way around too. You can walk into a boss's office and say, hey boss, you were really harsh in today's meeting. Mm -hmm. Are you okay? What's going on? I'm worried about you. And very often people in those positions haven't had anybody worry about them or express concern for them. You know, that concern has to go up. Leadership, unfortunately, is sometimes a very lonely position. There's fewer of you when you're in, in senior leadership and people assume you know everything and they assume everything you're doing you did consciously. And they assume you don't have fatigue and you don't have bad days. And, and if you're having a bad day, you must be an asshole, you know? And the reality is sometimes, uh, but not always. Um, and so, uh, empathy up the chain of command, like I said, the person who goes first is the one who's the leader. You're not, you're not a leader because you're at the top of the organization. You're the, the, you're the leader because you chose to take the risk first, the risk, the risk, uh, the first to take the risk to trust, uh, the risk to go first towards danger, the, the first to stick your neck out. And again, you don't have to do these things alone. If somebody says, don't worry, if it goes south, we'll be here to support you. That'll give you the courage to even have those difficult conversations with somebody who outranks you. But to do it in private and to do it uh, uh, with with empathy, re and it may not connect the first time because they may not be used to it. You know, sometimes we we have employees who join our team from other companies, from other organizations, and they're they're toxic and cold and distant. But that doesn't mean they're bad people. We don't know we don't know what organization they left. We don't know what they had to do to to, to for self preservation in in the place they came from. It's like a, it's like an abused puppy. Sometimes it just takes a little. A little time and uh, 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 for them to realize that don't worry when we say we care about you we actually mean it you don't have to put your walls up um, and that sometimes it's the same for leaders yeah wow that's powerful thank you I'm gonna read this one to you from one of our employees who says your website describes you as an unshakable optimist uh, Simon how do you maintain that stance during difficult times as a leader so optimism is often confused with blind positivity. They are not the same thing. You know, uh, uh, p blind positivity is unhelpful and unhealthy. You know, a lot of leaders think that they have to be positive all the time to keep their team, uh, 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 you know, inspired, and it's just completely wrong. Um, everything's fine, everything's good, everything's fine, everything's good is not helpful. In fact, sometimes it can backfire because when other people are feeling down or or struggling and, and our, we see our leader positive and happy every day, we actually, think it's us, we think it's worse because look how positive they're able to be. 
optimism is not denial of the current state. Optimism is the belief that the future is bright. It's not defeatist. It's literally optimistic. So we can talk about darkness. We're in a dark tunnel. COVID is, has, is, has hit us hard. It's been rough on our families. It's been rough on our organization. We're in a period in America of great uncertainty. It's hard. We don't know where we're going to go. But I believe that if we come together and work together, that we will come through this stronger than we went in. That's what optimism looks like and sounds like. It's the belief that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, even if we don't know how far away that, that light is or how long it's going to take us to get there, that we, if we work together, we will get there. But it is not a denial of the current state. We can absolutely talk about darkness. Wow. Okay, here's a here's a I think a very intriguing question. I can't wait to hear what you say about this. Uh, one of our employees says, "I find it difficult to dance along the line of empathy and curiosity while not prying into my uh, employees' personal lives." And do you have any advice on how you don't cross the line in in um, you know, sort of delving into someone's personal experience. So, you know, you're not going to them and, and, and asking personal questions um, that that cross a line. You're expressing concern for how they are. You know, I, I noticed that that your performance is down. I just wanted to make sure you're OK. Is mm -hmm. there any is there anything going on? They can say I'm just having a hard time. You know, it's not about y y your responsibility is not to get all the details. Your responsibility is to make somebody else feel like somebody has their back. And sometimes that just means listening. Sometimes that means just putting it out there and letting them know that you're there if they need anything. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's expressing concern for someone. Um, and again, this, this goes back to that concern about, like, I, it's, this is analogous to the, the example I gave before, of, you know, after George Floyd, the number of leaders who did nothing because they were afraid of inflaming a situation. You, you can you find yourself in the same sticky situation where, you know, I'm so afraid of you know, of overstepping my bounds and asking the wrong questions and delving too much into someone's personal life. I'm just gonna say nothing. And I'm just I'm not gonna do anything. You know? It's perfectly legitimate to say, I, I'm really nervous to have this conversation because I'm really worried about you, but at the same time, I I don't want to cross any lines or delve into you, but I do want to know how you are because I'm worried about you. You know, I, I again, there there is there is a difference between mm -hmm. pushing and digging, and being unprofessional, um, uh, and just being worried for from one human being to another. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So uh, this question is about your advice on how an organization or how U of L, for example, can best identify leaders who aren't already in management roles. Um, to help sort of cultivate and elevate them. So, you know, the, the thought of sort of developing uh, new leaders who maybe haven't had a chance yet to, to be in that position of uh, management. So um, we need more metrics. You know, traditionally, the metrics we have in an organization are performance metrics or tenure, neither of which qualifies someone for a leadership position. Yeah, just because you're good at your job doesn't mean you're good at leading other people to do the same job. And just because you've worked there for 10 years doesn't mean you're good at leading anybody, regardless of how they, uh, how, how long they've been there. Um, I had the opportunity to work with the Navy SEALs, and in particular, with the director of training for one of the elite groups within the Navy SEALs. And I asked him, how do you choose who gets into this elite group? And he drew me a chart on a piece of paper, he drew me a graph of um, uh, uh, X, Y axis, performance versus trust. Mm -hmm. um, and the way they define poor performance is how good are you at your job, you know, uh, um, and the way they define trust is what kind of person are you? And clearly nobody wants the low performer of low trust. Clearly everybody wants the high performer of high trust. What they learn is that the high performer of low trust is a toxic team member. And they would rather actually have a medium performer, sometimes even a low performer, it's a relative scale, of high trust over the high performer of low trust. And the problem is in most organizations, we have a million metrics for someone's performance and negligible to no metrics for someone's trustworthiness. And the irony is it's actually very, very easy to identify these people. Go to any team and ask them who the asshole is and they'll all point to the same person. <laughs> there is a high performer of low trust. And very often when we don't identify these people, we promote them into positions of leadership and then they become toxic, toxic team members become toxic leaders. I, also, if you go to any team and say, 
Who do you trust more than any other? Who, when the chips are down, they're always there and they've got your back. They'll also all point to the same person. And by the way, that person may not be your, your highest individual performer, but they might be your most gifted natural leader. And that person needs to be fostered and promoted. Um, and by the way, the low perform, the high performer of low trust doesn't mean that they're they're ripe for dismissal either. They're ripe for coaching. Whether you're a low performer or a low trust person, you're both ripe for coaching, because both both things can be coached. The only time somebody is ready for dismissal if they prove to be uncoachable. I don't think I need any help. I've been doing this longer than you have, you know. And if that's a repeated behavior, at some point. We want to help them transition to a place where they're probably going to be more happy because they're clearly not happy in our culture. And we want them to be happy somewhere. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means that we want them to find happiness somewhere else. Um, and we have to be open to that. But, but someone's coachability, I think, is much more important than their positioning on the scale. But like I said, we have to have the ability to measure more things than simply performance before we, um, before we identify someone for promotion. So I really appreciate that. And someone is asking about this idea of courage. And is is courage coachable? Are, are there uh, skills that you can learn around courage um, that will help you get there, Simon? Everything's coachable. Yeah. You know, um, you, leadership is like parenting. It's a capacity. You know, every everybody has the capacity to be a parent. Not everybody wants to be a parent and not everybody should be a parent. Um, and leadership's the same. Everyone has the capacity for leadership. We don't all want to be leaders and we don't want to, uh, and not everybody should be a leader. It comes a great personal sacrifice. Um, you know, you're not just responsible for your job. Now you're responsible for human beings. It's a 24 seven job. You know, your job you can do during work hours, but leadership you have to do all the time. Again, like being a parent, you don't get to turn off being a parent. It's, you're not, you don't cease being a parent when you go to work, you know, and leadership is the same. You don't cease being a leader when you go home. And not everybody wants that kind of sacrifice. They're not, it, 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 it really is, it, and it's sometimes lonely and, 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 you, and thankless and you get no credit sometimes. You know, you have to, when things go well, you have to give away all the credit and when things go wrong, you have to accept all the responsibility. I mean, that's no fun, you know? Um, but like being a parent, when you see your team solve an unsolvable problem, when you see people on your team rush to each other's aid, when you see them find courage that they didn't think they had, just like being a parent, those moments, it makes being a leader all, worth all the sacrifice. To see people rise and become be the better versions of themselves, it is a magical, magical thing. Um, so um, all, all those things are coachable. And like I said, the courage thing is more about relationships and the quality of our relationships. And, and when we have strong, trusting, loving relationships, um, it's remarkable that people are able to find the courage that they didn't think they had. Oh, wow. I love that. You know, uh, leadership is one of our cardinal principles. And, and in the description, it says, you know, this hashtag I am U of L is not just something that you you wear at work, but you're always, you know, you're as a leader, you're always uh, carrying that responsibility and the, the yeah. privilege and the responsibility of leadership. So I love that. Neely, I want to just we're we're close to the end of our time here. And I just want to um offer the floor back to you for a moment for final thoughts or maybe a final um, question and, and uh, Simon as well, just so that we can uh, close out our time here together today and and uh, leave people with just some final thoughts. Um, first of all, Brian, I want to thank you. I think that if people asked our employees at UFL uh, to think of someone who would stand by them and who is a natural leader, I'm convinced that your name would come up a lot. So I'm thankful to you for doing this. Simon, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I think for our team, uh, part of the responsibility for creating conditions that foster the courage comes to me. You know, I we need to say uh, what happens to people when they take a chance. You know, are we actually supporting them in that quest? I hope everybody will remember that managers are appointed, but leaders are really anointed by their peers as you are the leader. Uh, Simon, I want to thank you for your focus on courage, empathy, curiosity, and that all of these are coachable. Uh, you give us great hope. As an educator, it's clearly something I believe. People may have differing natural abilities, but these are all skills that we can uh, focus on and develop. 
So Simon, you mentioned the video. Are there things you are reading now? Other resources you would recommend to all of us? Uh, sure. Um, I, I, have, I coincidentally happens to be on my desk, but I like this book, How to Talk to Kids So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. It's a, it is That's a parenting right. book, but it turns out talking to adults is just like talking to children. Um, uh, and, you know, a lot of the, the coursework, and Brian, you know this, um, uh, you know, it doesn't require spending huge amounts of money on high-priced consultants. Sometimes if somebody's reading a book that they find interesting, start a book club. Yeah. And people can volunteer to show up every week and read a chapter where somebody can teach to the subject of the book. And it can all be homegrown. You know, if you can afford a book, you can you, you have a leadership curriculum. Um, so so uh, not all this stuff has to be fancy. It can be homegrown, which I love. Um, there's a there's a there's a movie I'd recommend called Kumare, K-U-M-A-R-E. Um, it's. Uh, it, 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 he doesn't, the, the documentary maker doesn't realize he made a good leadership documentary. He set out to reveal this idea of false gurus, sort of the guru culture. And he makes a sort of a mockumentary and something happens that goes sideways. And it actually is a very, very good uh, exploration of what leadership is. It's actually very interesting. So ha have fun with that one. I love it. I've seen it. I was like, I know I've seen it. Once you talked about it, yes, it's a great, great movie. It's yes, you're absolutely right. That's wonderful. Simon, thank you for joining us today. Uh, please know that you have great fans and friends at the University of Louisville. Thank and you. this is to remind all of the people listening in that we are a top research university. We're an R1 university, but we are also uh, oh gosh, about less than 70 among 4,000 or so that are also highly community engaged. We have 40% Pell Grant eligible students. So our leadership is important. And that's everybody listening in because our why is that we transform lives for the better through higher education of individuals, of families, and of communities. So again, that. Simon Sinek, we cannot thank you enough. Thanks, uh, you know, the demands on your time. Kyle Horwitz, thank you so much for making this possible. Thank you, Brian Buford. And for everybody, be well, continue to mask, be careful, and go cards. Go cards. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.